G'day and welcome to the channel. I recently spent three and a half days solid birding with good mate and fellow YouTuber Jan Wagner. So I was very grateful to Jan for inviting me down to Melbourne to test out Canon's new telephoto lenses, those being the RF 6 and 800 f11 lenses and the Canon RF 100 to 500. I was really excited to try out these lenses and see how they perform. So we both took thousands of images and I highly suggest you jump over to his channel, subscribe and check out all his photos and his thoughts on the lenses as well. So in today's video I just want to share with you some of the photos that I took over the weekend. I took 8,000 images and today I'm just going to showcase the best. So we visited a number of different habitats, the beach, the forest, we tried it in low light and direct light. So I was able to capture lots of different photos which will help test these lenses so that you can have some idea of how they'll perform wherever you are. I'll be sure to do an actual proper technical review later on. Today's just about looking at some photos. And obviously just a quick disclaimer, these photos I'm about to show are the best that I got. I took plenty of bad photos, plenty of blurry photos. I don't want you thinking I've just gone out with these lenses and taken non-stop beautiful photos. That's just not the case. So my trip started with a three and a half hour drive down to Melbourne. I met Yarn in a local park where there'd been reports of gangang cockatoos. So I thought the 100-500 to would be the perfect lens for these gangangs because you can often get quite close. I was immediately struck with just how light the lens is. I couldn't actually believe it. It's only 300 odd grams less than the 100-400 to but the weight difference was definitely noticeable. It just seemed really well balanced. So it didn't take long before we heard the birds feeding. It's a very distinctive sound as they, as they bite open these fruits for the seeds in the middle. So the versatility of the zoom was instantly apparent. We approached this bird and, and the bird was almost too big in my frame. So I was able to zoom out to 300 millimeters and capture this feeding pose. I quite liked how it had those berries coming out of its mouth. I felt that there were a few distracting elements in this shot and I thought I might try an actual headshot. And so I was simply able to turn the zoom on the lens and go into 500 millimeters. And then I cropped that image in and we got this beautiful headshot. It's such an advantage being able to zoom in and out and change your framing without having to move. I'm so used to using primes where you have to walk backwards or walk forwards to do this. I quickly checked on the back of the camera and I was pretty impressed with how sharp these images were. So I was looking forward to seeing how the remainder of the shots would turn out. But as we look for these birds, it turned out to be very difficult to get shots with nice backgrounds. As you can see in this shot, when you zoom out, your depth of field increases and we can see how the light was hitting the background and it just wasn't very pleasing, which made it quite difficult. So I sort of resorted to just getting headshots. By doing that, by using 500 millimeters, getting close to the birds drastically reduces our depth of field and improves those backgrounds. So we came across this juvenile male. You can see how the red feathers are just starting to come in. I used 500 millimeters, got close, and I was really happy with this shot that I got. The framing with a few of the leaves around its head, the dark background kind of works in this shot for me. And I just loved the detail, the eye contact, and I was happy to take this shot. So the last shot I got in this session was a, another headshot of a juvenile male. I quite like the background in this one, and obviously that eye contact. Again, I was really impressed with just how sharp it was. When I was looking on the back of the camera, I was thinking, this is like as sharp as my 500 millimeter prime. This lens delivers almost prime quality in a zoom, which is pretty amazing. And I must admit, the ability to just walk around handheld without being stuck to a tripod, because we were going up hills, through bushes, it just would have been almost impossible lugging around a heavy prime and trying to set it up with a tripod. Just being able to shoot handheld, zooming in and out, made this a pleasurable shooting experience. And I don't think any other lens could quite compare or get us the shots that we got. So when I was walking back to the car park, I spotted the a, the white back magpie version that they get in Melbourne. So the magpies up here have black backs. So I wanted just to get a shot because I didn't have any of the white backs. So I just dropped down onto the ground, I laid down with the lens, framed up the bird, hit the shutter, took a number of photos, and I was pretty happy with the result. I got up and walked back to the car. So it was such a pleasure being able to adapt quickly, knowing I had good quality images and I knew they were gonna be sharp. It really was a pleasure. The next morning we decided to return to the forest we visited previously just to try out the Canon F11 lenses in really low light in a dark forest. One of the biggest complaints with these lenses is that they're just unusable in low light due to that high ISO and the low shutter speed. So we were keen to just try them out for ourselves and see how they performed. We managed to get two birds on the perch and I instantly hit that shutter and took lots of photos. I immediately noticed that the AF was a lot slower and less accurate than the 100-500. And using these F11 lenses, the AF coverage actually shrinks. 
So with the F11 lenses, your AF coverage reduces to a square in the middle of the frame, similar to the 5D4 size. The auto AF won't work outside this box, so it's just something to be aware of. But I managed to get those birds in the frame and rattled off some shots, and I was pretty happy with how this shot turned out. Now, as you would expect, it had a fair bit of noise at 12,800, and the detail was lacking when you zoom in. However, once you process the image and you view it sort of full frame, I was pretty happy with this shot. With the power of Topaz Denoise and a bit of Photoshop, the photos cleaned up really well. So once I'd taken a few shots with the 600, I decided to switch over to the 800. Obviously a lot more focal length now, and it was immediately obvious in the viewfinder just how much bigger the perch and the bird was. And I had a robin land on there, and I started taking photos, and then a second bird's landed on the perch, and I just simply couldn't fit it in because I had too much focal length. And that is an issue with 800 millimeters. But the benefit of that is the bird actually now has a lot more detail. So when we look at this shot, it actually looks really good, even at that ISO 12,800. So I actually ended up taking another shot of just the perch. I knew that that second bird was in the frame and I didn't want it there, so I took another shot of the perch. And that's actually a good tip. Just take photos of your perch without the birds on them, and then you have access to that file later on in post-processing. So overall, both lenses worked pretty well. The IQ was lacking, the AF did struggle, but you could definitely take photos at 12.8 in low light conditions and get photos that you know, I'm still happy with. Now, as we were packing up, I just had the 800 and the R6 in my hand, and I spotted a Eastern Yellow Robin land on a um, tree just on its own, not far away. So I thought, oh, I might as well get a shot. That looks quite nice. So I've walked over to the Robin, you know, put the camera up, focused on the bird, took some shots, and then afterwards I looked at the camera and noticed I was at ISO 12,800, F11, and 320th of a shutter speed, handheld, and I got this shot. I was actually pretty amazed that, you know, I really like this shot. And to think that I got that with a lens that costs less than a thousand US, that's pretty impressive. So let me know in the comments if you would be happy with these shots. For the afternoon, we decided to head back to the Gang Gangs for another shot at them. And I decided to hold on to the 800 and give that a whirl and see if I could take photos with that awful minimum focus distance of six meters. You know, that's probably one of the biggest weaknesses of this lens. It just means you've got to stand back a lot further, so I was keen to try it with these gang gangs and see if I could do that. We got lucky pretty quickly and we found a male feeding. So with the 800 I was able to get a, a really good headshot. I think I must have been at about six meters away when I took this and I just love how this shot turned out. The beautiful head, the curled up feathers, the eye contact, you know, the out of focus background even at f11. Overall, I was stoked to capture this, and what a great way to start the session. And it was apparent to me again how much of a pleasure it is to have a light lens. The 800 is super light. You could handhold this all day long. So to have 800 millimeters in such a light package is a real bonus. Now, as we were walking around looking for some gang gangs, I spotted a noisy miner up in a tree, a very common bird in Australia and one people often overlook. But I thought, hey, it's on an open perch. Just lifted the camera up, took a photo, and looked on the back of the camera and because I had so much focal length the bird was fairly big in the frame and I quite liked this pose and overall I was happy with the shot just another shot to add to the bank so as we were walking around we couldn't hear any gang gangs and I must admit we'd probably been birding for about 12 hours my legs were killing me my feet were really sore and I was ready to pack up and go home but to Jan's credit he suggested we do one more lap of the park and I think this is something people probably don't fully appreciate when it comes to birding luck comes to those that put in the time and my legs have quickly learned that Jan likes to put in a lot of time. And that's one of the key reasons he has so much success. As we were coming to the end of our final lap, we spotted two people with their mobile phones out, pointing them towards a tree. And we both instantly knew that there were gang gangs there. These people were photographing the gang gangs. So we've approached, those people have walked off, and sure enough, male and female, down low, both of us got excited again, got ourselves into a good position. I focused on the female, and there was a eucalypt tree as the background took lots of shots and her crest came up, rattled off a heap of shots, and I was actually really impressed with just how sharp and the detail captured in this. Because of that fixed F11, I was using ISO 6400, but the R6 can handle that no problem whatsoever. As we were photographing this pair, we heard a lot of other birds circling around and start landing. And what happened over the next half an hour is what you sort of dream of with birding. It was just birds everywhere, opportunities everywhere. We didn't know what to shoot, where to shoot, Yarn went off and he was shooting and I was shooting 
and next minute I could hear Jan yelling, there's two birds in the open, there's two birds in the open. Quick, quick, he was yelling at me. So I've run towards him, I could hear him yelling. I've come towards him and sure enough, there was a male and a female on a perch out in the open. And this is sort of the shot you dream of, you know, a male and a female like this. So with my 800 millimeters, I've sort of stood on the hill, tried to get eye level out up the camera in the lens and just focused on the birds and just hammered away at that shutter, hoping these were gonna be sharp shots. So I've managed to get this shot of this pair. And I, I have to admit, I'm over the moon with this shot. Now the IQ is lacking, but it doesn't really matter. Behavior more than makes up for it. And when you're sort of got this sort of wider angle, the IQ isn't as important. The light's good, the background's good. Overall, a super image that I was stoked to capture. Now I thought the session was over, because the sun was just starting to set, but we heard some long bill corellas calling over on a hill. My old legs carried me towards this hill, and as we climbed the hill, we saw probably the biggest flock of long bill corellas we've ever seen, probably 100 birds playing in the grass. Now, I wanted to capture some, you know, playful behavior of these corellas, but I misjudged the actual focal length because I've laid down on the ground trying to capture it and the birds were just too big in the frame and I missed these action shots. So I could have moved backwards, but by the time I did that, the birds had moved and I'd missed that moment. So it's just something, I guess, if you use this lens more, you'd be better able to judge the distance that you need to be. Now I did get this one shot of the bird giving us a nice pose as it played with a stick, which I was happy to cap. So after 14 hours of birding, we hopped into the yarn's truck and we had an hour to drive back to his place. And obviously when we were driving back, I was reflecting on just how well the 800 performed in this session. So after a very short sleep, we were up again very early, back in his truck, driving south of Melbourne towards the beach to look for the beautiful hooded plover. I was really happy when there were no clouds, the sun hadn't quite risen yet. We arrived at the beach. So I haven't been to the beach for quite a while and I was absolutely in my element as we got there. The sun was just coming up, you know, the waves were crashing. It really was a beautiful scene. We've made our way down these stairs, out onto the beach, started walking on the beach looking for these hooded plovers. You know, I was just absolutely excited and filled with anticipation of what was ahead. Now I decided to use the 800 just for that extra reach because the plovers are actually quite small birds. So we walked along the beach and there were three birds ahead of us. So two adults and a young bird. I really wanted to capture all three birds together, but that would be a real challenge to get them all sharp and all looking at me with the depth of field of the 800. But I've laid down on the ground and I used a technique that I often use when photographing multiple birds. I simply photographed each bird separately. I just moved the focus point with the traditional AF, photographed the first bird, middle bird, and third bird. And then in post-processing, I've actually merged those three images together and I've come up with this image. A really nice pano of the scene of the three birds and again, we had beautiful morning light. The F11 has worked fine with the background. Overall, I'm really happy with this image and I'll gladly add it to my collection. So I lay down on the water's edge, just watching the birds as they fed. They often follow the water line. And whenever I photograph shorebirds, I'm really trying to get some sort of behavior or action. So a foot up, some sort of movement, and you generally need pretty good autofocus to do this. Now the 800 autofocus leaves a little bit to be desired because if you have a smaller box and it's just not as fast or accurate as the 100 to 500 or my prime. However, I persisted and I did manage to get this shot. So I was very happy with this pose with the bird moving through the water. I also wanted a few shots of the adults because they do look quite a bit different with that distinctive black head. Now a lot of seaweed had actually washed up onto the beach and the birds were sort of feeding around the seaweed. So I thought that would make quite an interesting shot. So I've sort of crawled towards the birds. I've got down low. I waited for the bird to sort of be in the open because I always like to get the feet. I'm not a big fan when you sort of cut half the bird off or you miss the feet. But I did like that little pile of seaweed to give you the sense of where the bird is and the habitat, the seaweed in the background, the nice light. Overall, the scene just works for me. Now my ISO had dropped to 1600 because we were getting a bit more light. So we decided to keep walking up the beach because we spotted some seagulls and we really wanted to try out the two times converter on the 800 millimeter lens, making it a 1600 F22, which is just ridiculous. To have 1600 millimeters is, you know, three times as much focal length as my 500 millimeter prime. And if you told me that you could take photos at 1600 F22, I would have told you you're crazy. I wasn't expecting a lot, but I thought it was worth a try. We put the two times on, approached these seagulls. I've got down low, I've got pretty close. I've framed up this gull, taking a heap of shot. That was, when I looked on the back of the camera, I was shocked, to be honest. I just didn't think it would have that much detail and be that sharp. 
it blew me away. Now, we were shooting in the very best conditions. We had a lot of light, I was really close, I was down low. Basically, you can't get any better than that. So any other photos you get with this combination is gonna be worse than that. Now, there was also a crested turn that allowed a nice headshot. Again, performed very well. Background has, background's out of focus just purely because it's so far away and I was so close. I thought a good thing to try and test would be a bird that was a long distance away. And there was a Pacific gull that had actually flown over onto, a, onto some rocks and there was a big channel between us. It was, it was a long way off. I reckon 50 to, 50 to 80 meters away, this, this gull. Picked up the lens and I was surprised with just how big the bird was. 1600 millimeters is a, is a lot of focal length. Now I've focused on the bird, I've taken some shots. When I looked on the back of the camera, I was pretty happy with the actual framing of it, the actual photo, because the depth of field has included some of the water, you know, we've got the rocks, it's a nice over the shoulder pose. Overall, really happy with it. But when we zoom in, we can clearly see that the detail has disappeared. You would expect that at this focal length. But overall, I'm actually happy with this and I will add this photo to my collection. Just before you rush out getting it two times, just know you're gonna need a lot of light to be able to capture these. So sort of middle of the day, bright sunlight to even photograph it. So in the afternoon, we drove out to the Western Treatment Plant. We noticed lots of swallows and martins flying around. Actually, there were heaps of them. So they were landing on, these, on this dry vegetation and I thought, why not we'll get a few shots? So I still had the 800. I've approached these um, martins and welcome swallows and took a number of shots and I was pretty happy with how this shot turned out. You know, you've got the distinctive white back of the fairy martin. And believe it or not, when I checked my records, this was the first photo I'd ever taken of this species. So this is actually Australian bird 379 for me, so a real bonus for the day. So as we were driving around, we noticed hundreds of Australian shell ducks. I don't have any decent photos of these shell ducks because they're so flighty. However, we spotted a male and female out in the middle of this lake on a rock. It actually was quite a nice scene, but it was way too far away. So I decided to actually put the two times on the 800 and shoot at 1600 f22 again. I actually handed the lens and camera to Jan and the, he was in the driver's seat and he's just pointed out the window of the truck, taken these photos. We weren't expecting much to be honest and we've continued driving on. It wasn't until I got home and I looked at the image that it captured and again I was pretty shocked. Sure the background's rubbish, the pose is fantastic, you've got two birds, the details okay and it's a shot I never would have got if I hadn't had this combination. And I was very happy to add this to my collection again. As we drove around, we heard the distinctive call of the golden-headed cysticula. So we stopped and I managed to get this far off photo of a, of a little bird in the reeds and that's how we saw them all around. So we got out and played a bit of a call to attract the birds closer. I was pretty happy when the birds landed on this nice vegetation allowing these shots. Now I got myself down low using the 800 focused on the birds and it put that background out of focus just because it was so far away. For whatever reason, the lens struggled a bit in this scenario. I got quite a few soft shots, but I did get a couple of sharp ones, but I was a little bit disappointed with how many shots were unusable. So we had one more day of birding together and we decided to drive out into this beautiful forest with massive eucalypts, lots of tree ferns. It really was a beautiful spot. Now we went there looking for the beautiful flame robin. And it didn't take us too long to find them. There had actually been a grader going down the road, pushing soil and dirt to the side, and the birds were actually feeding in this dirt, looking for bugs and whatnot. We simply took out an old tripod, attached a perch to it, plonked it down where the birds were feeding, put some mealworms on the perch, and before long, a bird had jumped up and started feeding on it. Now, to our surprise, there was actually a young bird there, a fledgling that probably hadn't left the nest all that long ago. Now, this young bird's hopped up onto our perch and started calling. It's like it knew the food was there and saying, someone feed me. The adult bird has jumped up onto the perch, it's grabbed a couple of the worms, and it's fed the bird. All the while, we're both standing there just firing away, both hand held. I think I had the 100 to 500 at this point and we took lots and lots of photos and I was very happy with this. The only downside is the, the adult bird, for whatever reason, was missing its tail, which is a bit of a bummer, but overall I was really happy to capture these two birds in the one frame. So once I'd taken a couple of shots with the 100 to 500, I decided to grab the 600 because I'd largely ignored this lens. I really didn't take that many photos with it because I just preferred the focal length of the 800. But the 600 was really light. We had the flame robin jump up onto another perch. I've taken a number of shots handheld, and look, the detail is very good. The background's been dissolved even at f11. The bird looks great at ISO 3200. Very happy with how this shot turned out.
So we left the forest. It only seemed right to head back to the gang gangs for our final session. So we've got there. I've decided to use the 100 to 500 again because it's just such a good lens. So we walked around the park looking for the gang gangs and we spotted this magpie land in a eucalypt. We both instantly knew that, hey, this would make a pretty cool shot. The bird had picked a really nice perch, so we've made a beeline straight for this bird. It actually had a really nice pose as we were approaching with its back to the camera looking over. But unfortunately, as we got closer, the birds moved to a slightly different pose. I still like the photo, but I would have preferred to have the tail and the back facing us. So the shot again shows the sharpness of the 500 and the quality you're going to get from this lens. We left the magpie and heard the long billed corallas again. I really wanted a headshot of the species because they've got this unique long bill and they call it the cutthroat, the red on the neck. So we found a couple of birds just playing around and one had landed on like this metal railing. We've approached the bird and luckily it stayed there. We've got some headshots. Color in the background is actually a driveway of a house not far away. Now, as we were just getting closer, a dog's come along, scared the birds off, they've flown away and they didn't actually come back, which was a bit of a bummer. So after the Corellas, we found some more gang gangs and we took lots of photos. I'll show you the one photo that I really like from the session, this male gang gang cockatoo. What a beautiful bird. I like how it's framed. We've got that perch coming out the side. We've got the great eye contact. We've got the crest. Overall, another fantastic photo. I hope you enjoyed these photos half as much as I enjoyed taking them. Look, the lenses perform well. There are some issues with these lenses and I will go into more detail in a future video, but boy was I happy with the results that I got. Hopefully you can see what's possible with these lenses. You know, I did have some really good conditions and some good birds, but you can get nice shots with these lenses. And I think that's important to know. I'd love for you to leave some comments below. Let me know which was your favorite shot from my session. So if you have any suggestions or questions for the review, leave them below. So it really helps me if you give the video a thumbs up. I appreciate that. You can support the channel directly by becoming a member. And to those that have already joined, I thank you very much for that. So if you want to see more of this type of content, make sure that you subscribe. And until the next video, take care and bye for now. See you later. As we drove around, we heard the distinctive call of the, the golden-headed cystic... <laughs> Is it cysticola? Is it cysticola? Cysticola? Cysticola. We heard the distinctive call of the golden-headed cysticola. The golden-headed cysticola. 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 The golden-headed <laughs> We heard the distinctive call of the golden-headed cysticular. Cysticola. Cysticola? Cysticola. We heard the distinctive call of the golden-headed cysticular. Now, I can't even pronounce this bird, so I'm just going to call it the golden-headed, I think.